Welcome uh, to round two of our uh, Red Two of our, our Star Wars. Hi guys, hey, you gonna sit all the way back there? Or are you? Are you? <laughs> oh, okay. You know. Yeah, I know. I mean, I know here we're a big time audio engineer, but I don't think we need the microphones. You know, the, this technology is pretty good. <laughs> <Stop> speak up. <laughs> so uh, anyway, well, welcome to Florida. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, welcome to South Florida. Appreciate it. Hope the uh, the mugginess isn't. Uh, too much for your delicate California constitution. No, I, I grew up in Delaware. I got I'm used to humidity. All right. Not quite like this, but yeah. Well, that that would definitely do it. Do it. Let's uh, let's go back to the beginning. Um, where where did it theoretically all start from you? Because uh, you start out with some non Lucasfilm stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. Your dossier, uh, like Fear and Loathing, was one of your. Uh, that was early on. Yeah. Uh, it was actually a different Terry Gilliam movie. Was the first one. It was Twelve Monkeys. Oh, okay. That was my first uh, paying. Film gig, okay. so I called that my first movie. All right. Um, and I worked in special effects on that, oh, so okay. the practical effects, which right. is not CG or anything. It's a bunch sure. of explosions and mechanical things and all that. Um, and I met uh, the sound guys on that. And that's kind of more in the direction I wanted to go, uh, and got on their crew for a few years in production sound. So okay. it's like holding a microphone in the boom, that sort of thing. And this uh, was a classic apprentice, you know, story. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's you a, hold the microphones and then we'll, we'll see. Well, it's a, there's two different uh, disciplines. You've got the production sound guys, is, that's one thing, mm -hmm. um, which is more akin to like what, what we're doing here, um, all that sort of you know, hardware based live recording. And then the post production end of things, which is what I transitioned to. That's not a normal transition. No, no I, yeah. People do that's, that. yeah. Um, it was basically starting over, uh, and that's more editing. Yeah. You get well, everything those guys have recorded, cut it together, add in sound effects, and all you know, that stuff. So I'm into that. Yeah, so. Um, uh, in episode two. Yeah, so uh, no, obviously Gilliam liked you enough to bring you back, or was that just a, a <laughs> happen? That was not like the organization you were for that brought back. Yeah, yeah, it was the, the, the group, the sound yeah. guys got brought back. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we, we right. did uh, Fair and Loathing. Or uh, loathing. Many years later, yeah, yeah. A that movie that's still just. Yeah, yeah. I, I, can't, I can't believe it's that old. I still print. It's a great movie. It's really, really cool. Yeah, I like Terry. Yeah. 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 Really, yeah, really. Fun. I wish, I wish he would do more than one movie uh, every fifteen years. I know, but he's gonna do um, Don Quixote now. Again? Again. I can't, I've, I've been hearing that. I've been hearing that for fifteen years. <laughs> he's making another run at it. Um, God bless him. Yeah. So we'll we'll see how that goes. I don't know who's gonna be in this one. Yeah. Is is Death Coach trying to come back? I, I doubt it. Um, last I heard, he was looking at Adam Driver. All right. Um, but I don't know if that's true. Or not. That's what I read on yeah, the, but... the man. The, talk about a movie called the the man who killed Don Quixote, which has been this movie that's been Gilliam's been trying to make for years, and he made. There's a documentary on it now, mm -hmm. and that's it's really good about. It, it was truly a plagued production that just hit the sandstorms, and it just, God didn't want the movie made. That's... Well, it was the guy he hired to play Don Quixote. Um, if you don't know anything about the story, he's on a horse for most of the story. The guy that he hired to be Don Quixote, after they hired him to start a production on day one, told everybody that um, he was like, he had some back issues or something yeah. that precluded him from being on a horse, horse at all. Yeah. So that was a bit of a problem. And he spoke absolutely no English. No English, yeah. yeah that was, it was, it was a disaster. Uh, so it was, he was shot for like two weeks and scrapped it. Uh, yeah, so like that. Yeah. Um, Patriot, uh, that was another fun one. Um, I personally liked it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it was Nash Bridges. Uh, and then what What was your what was your first Luke's film? Uh, Star Wars Episode Two. Two, okay, okay. Attack of the Clones. Right. Yeah, it was and 2000, 2001. Now, what, what side of uh, pre or post were you on that one? Uh, I'll post. That was my okay, first, first, first post-production gig and my first Star Wars gig and my first Skywalker gig all in one. Oh, that's that, yeah. He came on his um, Matthew Three Roots. levels in one uh, jump. Well, it's a it's a lateral move. I mean, yeah. it's it's a just different thing than production. Um, but uh, it was Matthew Wood's assistant, actually. On that. He was the one that hired me, hired me as his assistant. So I've kind of been with Matt since I started there doing Star Wars. It's been like over 15 years now. I kind of, I kind of wish we just had both at the same time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we can go get them. No, it's, no. <laughs> I spent an hour with him. We were okay. good. We're, 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 we're good. We're good. Okay. We're good. So, um, so he he hires you on, and um, yeah, just just 
What was it, what was that like to get that? Oh my god, I'm I'm bringing Ron on with this film. What was that? It was great. Um, I've been wanting to get into uh, editorial for a while, and so I had moved to San Francisco for. Um, I got married, and my wife uh, lived in San Francisco. I was living in LA, and she won that coin toss, and I moved to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So it was it was the best possible scenario. And, you know, it was to work for Lucasfilm at that point. That's yeah. where they're, they're based in San Francisco, yeah. the area. So, uh, and I knocked on their door for a couple of years before they got me. Did a lot of... Did you ever knock on Pixar or something? Uh, no, I was, just wasn't really interested. In yeah. That. You know, I was going to stick with... They, they do some sound at Pixar, but it's... Really... Yeah, I know, it's weird, because they mostly just, just shoveled it off back door to Iowa, but... Uh, yeah, Pixar... There might, there might have been opportunities. Yeah, I guess it had it occurred to me at the time that they might do sound, I probably would have knocked on doors yeah. because I knew more people at Pixar than I did at Lucasfilm. It probably would have been a better route. But no, it, it worked out. Um, uh, a lot of luck and timing as well. Just the way it kind of usually is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> in that, in that. Um, to the sake of our audience, uh, what exactly is the difference between a sound designer and a sound editor? Um, so sound editors can be, uh, there's people that cut uh, dialogue, there's people that cut Foley, which is, Foley is like a personalized sound effects. If I put this down on the table, that sound will be recreated by a Foley artist um, in a small contained room with microphones and they may, not, they may use an actual phone to do it, maybe they'll use uh, something that looks like a phone or has a better sound than, than the phone will, and they'll recreate all those little movements, footsteps, all that stuff. That's Foley. Foley is always what, whenever you see a movie, usually a comedy that takes place on a back lot, that's always like somebody runs through a Foley scene with the people <laughs> yeah. <laughs> firing the starter pistols. Yeah, all the little. Yeah. They, they love that gag. It's kind of like watching somebody do a radio play, sound yeah. effects in a way. Sound effects editing, which is what I do, is more um, going out in the field and recording sounds or pulling sounds from the library. Explosions and spaceships and lasers and, and more mundane things too, like yeah. you know, some nice cooking eggs, you know, like you know, frying. Yeah. Well, that, that's a very good point about it too. People do kind of think it's yeah, that's this especially the sci-fi stuff. It's all bombastic stuff with sure. side effects, and it's just like uh, sometimes it's what is what is blue bantha milk going to sound like when yeah, you pour it? It's, you know? a lot of it's is just the mundane things, um, and all those little details are what. Part of the most important stuff are the little details because it helps support all the really big moments. So, to so answer the question, what a sound designer is basically is the head sound effects <laughs> editor. Yeah. So um, he's like the supervising sound effects editor, and they just call that the sound designer because they're also responsible for um, generating sounds um, in, in, in cases like sci-fi movies, making that spaceship or that laser. The designer designs those sounds, and he's in charge of his editors to say. You know, this sound is for this thing, and this sound is for this thing, and don't use this thing, and use this, and blah, 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 to help shape this, the sound effects track. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds good. That sounds good. Uh, your partner said you guys have come up with uh, something you want to be as the new Willem stream. <laughs> <Was he talking? laughs> or he, he alluded to that. You, uh, oh. you and he have been dropping some Easter eggs that have yet to be discovered. Did he tell you what it was? He didn't tell me what it was. Okay. I, kind of, I kind of didn't want to know what it was. Okay. Now it's good to me, it's going to be like an adult. I, I, I was really surprised he brought that up. Okay. Well, I asked I asked him, I said, how many times you used the Willem Street? Yeah, okay. You know? um, I'll ask you that too. But yeah, there's a time. secret. Yeah, so we, we do have a little sound effect where, where um, because the Wilhelm, I'm sure you all know the Wilhelm is. It's a classic sound effect that Ben Burt's been using as his calling card in his movies for years. And other sound editors and designers, yeah. supervisors have picked that up as a tip of the hat to Ben over the years. And Ben has moved on from that. He has his own new uh, super secret sound effect he's been using. And so, and uh, to sort of honor Ben's tradition, we have come up with our own new music. So maybe somebody will figure it out someday. Uh, in case you don't know, Ben Burt is was basically their their predecessor. He was your mentor. The, the, yeah, the, yeah, the mentor, and he was the original Star Wars sound guy. Created the all the original. Tie fighter sound effect and lightsabers and Darth Vader's breathing. Yeah, the one, the, the, the guy in the documentaries you see like hitting the cables, mm. creating the blaster sounds, which blew my mind as a kid. Oh sure. Like I saw that in sixty minutes, I was like, it's that, and I just thought, yeah, I was really never with it. I just thought that's got to be so cool to just 
go on out and bang things together and record them. And yeah, <laughs> and Matt and I would probably he probably told you that too. <coughs> Seeing that as a kid was really informative of what I wanted to do for it. It was probably the first movies, Star Wars, and maybe Raiders too, where you got to see really intimately behind the scenes. Yeah. Stuff they, they really spent a lot of time with behind the scenes and documentaries. I really kind of credit those two movies with making me, you know. It was just hard to get access to that stuff because there was no DVDs, DVD yeah. features. It was like, okay, 60 Minutes is a puff piece here. And yeah. Once in a blue moon on PBS, they'd have a documentary mm -hmm. or whatever. And then maybe HBO would be like, all right, for time filler, here's a behind the scenes. Yeah. yeah. But the, Ra the Raiders doc they did in like, whenever that was, 81 or something like that. Yeah. It just blew my mind. I just thought that was amazing. It's the, the, the second unit guy showing the dudes how to, the, no, no, and I mean, sure, I should have kicked the cigarette hanging out of his mouth. Yeah, yeah it's great. Just, just, and their yeah. eyes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, just, it, it, made, it made production interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really made it all mm -hmm. seem like, oh wow, I maybe mean, it's maybe it's not just, you know, cotton print product. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a mundane. The, the, the old gag of the beret wearing director, mm -hmm. you know, you know, like playing on the set. Yeah. Uh, what, uh, did you ever have like, uh, that, that crazy moment uh, going around recording something where just on the first try you're like, that's perfect. I don't need to do much with that. Uh, no. No, it's just <laughs> always, it's always just been... Maybe I can work with that, maybe I can fix that. Yeah, and most times if you feel like that and you've recorded it, you're wrong. You yeah. Know, and then you, you come back and, okay, that didn't work at all, or that was not what I was after in any way. It's, it's so much of it is trial and error. Mm -hmm. Happy accidents, unhappy accidents. I mean, it's um, uh, it's experimentation. That's that's kind of the heart of doing sound effects design is, is um, experimentation. That's the fun part, too. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So uh, what was your first transition from the, the production side of the glass to the VO talent side of the glass? To do a voiceover? Yeah. Uh, I started auditioning for voiceover, it was before I started at Lucas, um, 98 I think, something like that. Uh, and I'd been an extra a few times in some films. Um, I don't know if I have that, quite had the acting bug, but it was, I was always really curious about it. Yeah. And then once I finally get in, got into post and I got a little more serious about it, seeing more up close and personal what voice actors do every day and meeting voice actors and dealing with you know the editorial side of that, yeah. I got a little more serious about it and you know, took some classes and had some training and <laughs> got an agent, demos and all that stuff and started auditioning. And uh, Did you like always talk about this or is this something you kind of kept secret on the side? <laughs> uh, well, you don't want to keep it too secret because then yeah. that's the, the, the name of the game is networking. Yeah. Um, for all things. But I guess so. there's that peril of you don't want to be perceived as abusing your technical position. No, because uh, if if your co-workers that where I work, if, if they are doing their own projects, several projects will be going on at once yeah. at Skywalker, so if somebody else has a project going on, and you know we need to hire some uh, ADR, some loop group people, yeah. some generic ADR people. Um, we know that you and Matt do that sort of thing. Yeah. We're going to come into this group, so that it's kind of helpful for people to know those things. Because yeah, yeah. um, Matt told us the Alan Smithy story. Yeah, with the General Grievous. Grievous. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, we don't. It, it's it's still not the main thing that we do. The main thing yeah, we do it, is still, it is a yeah, it's a yeah. side plot thing. But just uh, it's just a case of. Somebody just taps you on the shoulder and says, hey, can you come, come on in here and just, just do this quick bit? Sometimes it's that. I mean, often it's not. Often it's it's, it's still auditioning for, for things. And uh, sometimes in the case of like uh, like Tito in episode seven, who's the little desert bandit guy, yeah. um, that was a, a blend of doing voiceover and sound design because it was a character that spoke no English. There was no subtitles. Um, and he had to be somewhat processed because he was supposed to be, there was supposed to be somewhat of a mechanical element to the guy. Yeah. Um, so we made up a language for him. Um, the trick to that is having the right inflection at the right time to match the actor's movements on screen and to also sort of impart the idea you want to impart without speaking English. In, when you say creating a language now, did that 
did that have to be kind of like held up against uh, like other Star Wars languages? No. Okay, all right. Because it was a new planet. If it was Tatooine, we would probably want to make it Hatties. Okay. Um, because it was Jakku, and it was not clear where that planet was right. in, in the system. Uh, it was free reign to do what we wanted to do with that. It wasn't, we didn't have to like create a language that you could speak. Yeah, it wasn't like Klingon, yeah. Yeah, really, like, like, but the whole thing is, was, was it was just a case yeah. of somebody, okay, well, oh, that sounds a little too much like this, or let's, you know. Yeah. But you had a chance to create a new language. That's, yeah. yeah, so it was it was a thing that was rooted in, in uh, Thai uh, language, uh, and so I would... And you know somebody out there is trying to create a dictionary and stuff for right now. Yeah. There's a fan who's like, you know... I would just pick Thai words that I thought sounded good together. It sounded, you know, some sometimes they were their actual translated Google translated sentences, yeah. and then I'd kind of cut them up a little bit, and I like, think that word sounded better over here, and then make up a couple of syllables here and there, mm -hmm. and have it flow like a language. Yeah, and it's important to like if you repeat certain words, and so it, it it takes on the life of actually the language, the way people speak. You know, words get repeated sometimes, and. Um, the way you draw out vowels in certain words. If you just yeah. speak stream of nonsense, it's just going to sound like nonsense. Exactly. Yeah. I remember back, uh, uh, Annie Kaufman had to teach uh, Carol uh, Kane his latka talk. <laughs> and, and, and he tried to teach her the rhythm to it and everything else. And finally he just said, screw it. He said, we're going out to dinner, we're going to a restaurant, and we're only going to talk in this language. And it was just that, that her... Like ordering and eating uh -huh. and talking and the combining of his visual cues and his body language, she was right. able to kind of get not the language, but the yeah, the patter and the rhythms and yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's cool. yeah, it's, 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 it's just like actually twenty years. Ago, yeah, some people screaming their heads off. Then I saw him on TV next week. You know. <laughs> so, um, what was it like to uh, become a mame uh, with one word? Oh, the traitor. traitor yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, it, 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 was, it was a standout moment in the film. It really was. And I, it, it, a, de, a defining moment uh, uh, for him. Where yeah. It's just like, okay, he's, he's crossed the line, and now he's been outed. And it also makes, makes, you know, it's like like, like 2199. Like, mm -hmm. oh, what's his story if well, he has one, you know? Yeah, well, first, hats off to uh, Liang Yang, who's the, the stuntman mm -hmm. in that suit. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, it was nice to see, and I think maybe that's why he was so popular, that he, uh, a stormtrooper becomes so personal and emotional mm -hmm. and also so like good at his job yeah. uh, in hand-to-hand -hand combat and really bested Finn, so yeah. you know, with the lightsaber. Um, you never really, like you never seen that, actually. That's true, yeah. Maybe Granted, that, that was trained or whatever in that, that you know, yeah. the crazy baton contraption. And I thought it was, a, that was telling too, because curious enough, the the, the passion, that one line, I think it told a lot to me too, because it, it told me, it gave the implication of the mind wiping, or that, mm -hmm. that's been heavily, you know, it's like the on too, is oh yeah, they're heavily brainwashed, and we don't know how the process goes or whatever, but I got that illusion from that. Yeah, yeah. And I guess since that character uh, became so popular, uh, Lucasfilm has decided to give him a backstory. Oh, yeah. There's a, some. They were in the academy together, or whatever the training yeah. thing is that first order troopers do. And there was some rivalry there of some kind. Oh, okay. Uh, so yeah, it's two one nine nine where Finn was two one eight seven. So I guess they were in the same same, same unit. Clutch. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, clutch. yeah, whatever. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm sure. I'm sure that I'm sure there's gonna be a novel. I mean, you know, Probably. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, but that was I didn't know about the memes or anything like that until months later. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. I I don't. Well, you're too yeah. busy, I mean, theoretically. <laughs> well, I, I'm also just, yeah, I'm not very good at that social media thing. I don't really, I should probably pay attention to that stuff. Ah, well, it's, it's, all, it's all good. Uh, but uh, what other, what other is, in your mind, if you go back to on the voiceover stuff, what else has like stood out for you? Um, Either experience-wise or just like something that just, hey, I didn't know I could do a voice like that, you know? <laughs> uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. I really liked one of the first... Star Wars voices I did was in episode three. I think that was the first one. I can't remember. It was uh, GH7. It was the medical droid. Oh, at yes. At the end of the movie that tells Yoda and Obi-Wan that Padme's carrying twins and you got to operate quickly. She's lost and will live, all that yeah. sort of thing. Um, I liked that. That was one uh, that 
Ben Burt said, we, you know, they tried somebody and somebody else, and we want somebody that can do calm NPR radio voice. Yeah. Dave, give it a shot. So I gave it a shot, and, and uh, Ben said, okay, and then let George here, and George said, great. And uh, that was it. So that was, that was kind of exciting for me to kind of get that. Very important piece of dialogue. Yeah. Yeah, yes. Yeah, first of all. Theory, theory, you're the, you're, you're in, uh, chronologically, you know, in the storyline, you're the first person to, to talk about Luke and Leia. That's true. It's the first mention, yeah, of, of twins, no less. Yeah. 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 yeah that's true. There you go. That it occurred to me today, speaking of this totally non sequitur, as I was talking to somebody that, is Luke, is Luke technically a prince? Is Amidala, I mean, is she still considered a queen? Well, that was that was always the weird bit because they applied, like, elected to office and stuff like that. So, and a, har a hardcore fan could probably know the rule. I don't think the rules of, of Naboo's monarchy and royalty and all that stuff was adequately explained. Okay. But the whole yeah. line about electing a queen, yeah. and then I think later on there's a new queen when she graduates up to the Senate. So it's on a birthright. Yeah, I don't think it's a birthright. Okay, interesting. Okay. But I think I mean, Leia being the foster child of, of the Organas, you know. Right. So she's a double princess. Right. <laughs> she's a princess times two, Same. and yeah. Luke is, is, is wormy. He's half a prince, yeah. Yeah, he's wormy out of anchor head. So that's crazy. Uh, on the audio uh, side of it, uh, it's basically the same question. What, um, what would be considered like your most personally uh, like satisfying um, project to date know, that you was, may be allowed to discuss? <laughs> well, uh, the Clone Wars series is very personal to me. I really yeah. liked that, that uh, show. You guys have probably all seen Clone Wars in some way. Um, I worked on 120 some episodes of that show over six seasons. And, uh, Which is a really, really impressive. Yeah, it was a lot. Really, yeah. <laughs> really impressive for that that much in animation. And George was pretty involved with those for the first uh, several seasons, um, and then he eventually let Filoni just kind of have free reign. Mm -hmm. um, he trusted Dave to do that. And Dave's been amazing. The guy's such a powerhouse. Um, it was. Well, the first thing I got to do Star Wars wise that was my own that I could be the sound designer on. Yeah. Uh, and it was really daunting, really intimidating, and because they wanted it, it's going to sound like Star Wars, but there's all these new things here yeah. that we have to kind of create in that Star Wars vein. So that was it was challenging, but it was really fun. It was exciting, and the show was just fantastic too. On top of all that, so yeah. yeah, I really have a lot of. It's, it's going it, to. It, it will be. It's, I think that, that Cold War is definitely going to be remembered extremely fondly, and I think it's going to have those huge legs. Yeah. I think the next generation of Star Wars kids, yeah. they're going to be, you know, they're going to be given those DVDs, Blu-rays and stuff, and they're going to be like, wow. Yeah, it's great. It's really great. And I guess you can watch them in order now. Somebody's figured out the, because the, the show wasn't, the, the chronology of the episodes is not season order. Yeah, yeah, because there was stuff going on here with these characters. Meanwhile, back here, yeah, here, they kind of jumped around. It was concurrent. Yeah, and... yeah. Again, fan fandom always finds a way to explain. Yeah. <laughs> Even Thankfully, if we yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, what uh, for anything you're allowed to say? What's on the horizon? Um, we're working on Rogue One right now. It'll come out in December. And <laughs> it'll come out in December. And, uh, <laughs> Something will come out in December called Rogue One. Uh, episode eight. After that, um, I'm working on. I'll be working on Guardians of the Galaxy two. Um, somewhere in there. All right. And, yeah, that's what I say. Yeah, yeah. You, you've done it before. Uh, Thor: The Dark World, uh, Winter Soldier. I mean, you're yeah. You're neck and neck. Avengers two. Yeah. yeah. You've been doing the Marvel stuff as well. Yeah, I got a few. Uh, Guardians one. Um, yeah, I, I like working with Marvel's great, and uh, it's amazing how much product they, they put out every year. Two movies a year, and they're always home runs, every single one of them. I, Those guys are I, amazing. I, I attribute that to, um, to Figgy. Yeah. To him and the fact of his position that he is what I call a node. Mm -hmm. he, he is somebody who is both publicly and outwardsly the buck stops here. Mm -hmm. And uh, same thing with, with George, and I've always said, you know, 
people are critical of him, whatever else. I just always appreciated that it all, he's a little hand stamp and like, you know, mm -hmm. prove, prove, prove. Jim and some of the Muppets. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and like, you look at Warner Brothers in DC and I think that's, that, I think that's what they're lacking. Mm -hmm. They're lacking that one person to say, we're gonna do it like this and everything goes through. Yeah, maybe so, yeah. You, know. you ever dealt with uh, Figgy? Uh, yeah, um, he shows up to the final mixes of these okay. movies, so yeah. He's, um, he's definitely the big boss, everybody. Um, have you done anything with Doctor Strange, or...? No, I didn't work on Strange. Okay. No, no, no. Um, they do uh, do all the Marvel movies at Skywalker Sound, mm -hmm. but there's several different... Yeah, I know it's different, yeah. Yeah, different groups. I know it's not just you and me, yeah. Yeah, there's yeah, yeah, there's, there's hundreds, yeah. or hundreds, maybe a hundred of those. Yeah, yeah. If, 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 if... I imagine that's, uh, that's going to be a unique kettle of fish uh, with the yeah. magic use and, and how they're going to explore it. Yeah, I'm really curious Getting about that. Set like, up the precedence of it too. I really like the character. Yeah, uh, I adore I adore the character. So yeah. my finger my fingers are crossed because I'm hoping I hope they just the origin right because he needs to be he needs to be the prick yeah. who <laughs> discovers enlightenment for no other reason other than if I don't do this, no one will. Huh. As opposed to the well, your old girlfriend will be threatened. I mean, Doctor Strange's origin is always about wow. It's not all about me, mm -hmm. you know. And says that moment of. of Redemption. So I'm looking forward to I'm a, that. I'm a big geek. So. Is that next month that comes out? That's that's soon. It's, yeah, I don't know. yeah, I think it's yeah. it was a late October okay, release. Okay. So fingers crossed on that. So, um, any questions? Yeah, what are maybe not your favorite, but what are some of your favorite sounds you've created that you thought were really cool? Uh, I don't know. Um, to stick with Clone Wars, I, I, the Twilight ship, which was Anakin's kind of junky hot roddy junkie ship that was in the movie and then the first couple wrecks it at some point or Obi-Wan destroys it, I can't remember it was. Mm. Obi-Wan destroys it, I yeah. think, by accident or gets shot down. That was a fun ship to do because it was the first Star Wars spaceship that I made. Um, so I was trying to make something that was kind of Millennium Falcon-ish but not, I want to you know, lean on that as a, as a sound, but the idea of something that's kind of rough and raw yeah. and kind of sounded like it would live in that same universe. I was kind of proud of that one. The Twilight. Yeah. Or the Black Saber. I like that one too. The, um, Are those choices uh, your guys to make or is it just like the director's note or is it the script note? Okay, like, yeah, this ship should look cobbled together. So is that an impetus you guys start taking your own? Oh, then it sounds junky. We should do this. Or is that a direction? It's a collaborative, collaborative thing. Okay. Yeah, so uh, usually there's a, what we call a spotting <laughs> session where you get together with the director and you'll watch the movie, or if it's you know, the episode or whatever it is, and it'll say, okay, this ship should sound like that, and that thing should sound like this, and if he doesn't bring something up, you might offer suggestions. I mean, mm -hmm. if we try the, again, X, Y, and Z. Yeah. And it just becomes a, a discussion okay. about, about um, what it should sound like, and then you usually will present a few options. What about, you know, this, this, or this? And mm -hmm. sometimes they'll pick one, sometimes they'll pick none, and they'll just start over and try a different direction, and, um, Hopefully you don't go down a rabbit hole too far with that. I said I wanted an ice cream truck in space. Yeah, yeah. It can be tough sometimes to pull, because sound is, is that way. It's tough to describe uh, what something sounds like if it's if it's something totally new that doesn't exist. And you yeah. have an idea in your head of what it should sound like. It's, it's not always easy to articulate that. Yeah. And I get that. Um, so it, sometimes it takes, again, trial and error to come yeah. up with that. And there are some directors that just can't tell you what they want. They just can tell you. <laughs> now I don't like that. And they're like, oh, that's what I was looking for. <laughs> Back, I, I've done some free work with Michael Mann. And uh, yeah, he just, he cannot, he can't, he can't tell you. He mm. just only knows it when he sees it. That's a great director. Oh, yeah, he's a brilliant director. Yeah, like, yeah. It just, yeah, it's, it's like Kubrick, just lots and lots of footage over and over and over again until he gets that one. Mm -hmm. Which in animation, for what you mostly I worked into too, there's no, it's like, there's no this is the footage. footage. Yeah, that's, there's, this, this is it. We're not going back and redoing it unless yeah. there's a... Right. There's less, it's, it's just uh, subtractive when they, when they edit yeah. uh, animation. But there's rarely a director's cut yeah. of animation because they'll have like a scene and it'll be partially rendered. And if the scene isn't working, they'll try and get rid of it as early as possible so they don't spend the money and time fully rendering something like yeah. that. So you won't often see, you know, mm -hmm. the director's cut of animation because I don't want to go back and 
is there is there something that uh, was laborious for you that uh, ended up on the floor that you kind of lament? Uh, yeah, you, you, you kind of try not to get too personal about that stuff because yeah. if you get too precious about it, um, you're kind of losing the sight of the bigger picture sure. of what you're doing. But if it was something you got particularly attached to, oh, it took all night, but we finally got it. Oh, we, yeah. got, we dropped that scene. Sorry, <laughs> uh, you didn't get the message. I... Uh, there was a. How is it? Is there the snow speeder chase in episode seven? Of the deleted scenes. Okay. Um, that didn't happen. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of some, some, what you know. What happens a lot that gets uh, not that it gets cut necessarily, but the thing that happens a lot is in the final mix phase, where you're balancing sound effects against dialogue against music. If the director says at one point, you know what, in this scene we're going to make this all about the music here. This could be like a big, you know, somewhat surreal moment where all we hear is the music and. Mm -hmm. That's how we're gonna play this big emotional thing. And if it's like a big battle that you cut, and then suddenly the, all this weeks of work of cutting a battle scene will yeah. get burned away, and then it's just like a big music moment. And that's just, it's not about you, you know? Yeah. It's about the movie, and that's what the director wants, and that's kind of, but yeah, it's kind of a bummer, because you, yeah. you, you cut this <laughs> I worked really, so hard on Yeah, that. you cut this really cool thing, and you're like, oh, okay, well. I had to go to the zoo and record <laughs> tortoises. <laughs> But that's just the way it goes. It's yeah. part of the job. That's too many too big. Um, any other questions? Was there ever like a sound that was in the final mix that you thought, man, I wish you could go back and tweak that just a little bit? Every movie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it's just, um, you know, it's a, it's an art form and, and you just never really feel like it's quite done. So you never really, it, just time constraints and, and, and budget constraints and just... Only George is allowed to go back and change things. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's several several moments where I kind of thought, I, yeah, maybe I could have done better with that, or I, something else would have been better for this thing. Um, you want me to tell you one? Okay, here, let me see. <laughs> um, uh, FN two one nine nine has this electric baton that he uses. I liked what it ended up with, what it, how it ended up, but like looking back and like how massive that character became, I feel like maybe I could have done something even cooler with that. Ah. but I don't know. I guess it's okay. Uh, the on the first spin up that, yeah. was, that was perfect. Okay, <laughs> I think that I think that was perfect because it was it was like to me it was mechanical and I could hear the oil on it right. And it just there's something about that, that, that I thought that I thought the clunkiness yeah. gave it weight right gave it made it heavy. It's okay. No, this is not a lightsaber. Mm -hmm. This is a big clunky thing mm -hmm. that he's gonna hammer him with. Yep. You know? Yep. Yeah, it's, a, cool. it's a space sledgehammer with a little bit of energy in it. <laughs> so that, uh, yeah. It's, it's funny that without your character, the traitor guy, no one would know how Finn can defend himself with a lightsaber. Because everyone else is like, oh, well, the reason why is because, as you saw, you know, the strong are trained with these weapons. Without your character, no one would know about saying it's kind of interesting. Huh. I didn't think about that. That, yeah. that, that is sense. something, too. Yeah, I got, yeah. This is. Maybe, yeah. maybe Snoke is always one of them ready to take on Jedi. <laughs> we'll find Snoke. out, find out more about him. I should think. I hope so. Yeah. Or not? He's not dead. Right? <laughs> he didn't die. Snoke? No, I mean you're a traitor. Yeah. Um, I thought he died. He got shot. Got okay. shot by but the bowcaster. Yeah, that's true. It was him by the bowcaster. We finally saw the bowcaster in action too. Yeah. Finally. Yeah. Finally. <laughs> I mean, Anakin was chopped in half and thrown into lava, and we saw what happened to him. It, it's true. So it's yeah. How popular you are. That's. We, I mean, maybe the armor actually works once in a while, and uh, maybe he got like hit in the shoulder and passed out. There you go. Maybe that's why. Right maybe that's why Parasite <laughs> Chewie didn't use it because it didn't actually work against armor. Yeah. I mean, it'll knock the guy down, but it won't actually pierce the armor. Right. You know? <laughs> maybe that's how he handled all his time. So. so that's cool. So. um you got the stuff on the horizon. Uh, do you have any uh, social media outlets people can follow you on? Uh, uh, at Dave Acord on Twitter. Okay. Um, and I go by Manchovy on uh, Instagram. Manchovy, all right. That's, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. I always ask this of audio guys. Um, what's your ringtone? It's, you know, it's just a basic <laughs> iPhone ringtone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it used to be this... Um, Primus song called Porkchop's Little Ditty. Oh, I know, yeah. Yeah, because of my cat's name is Porkchop. Okay. 